So what we're gonna do to finish up, I think it's really important to let you know that we are now open. Uh, we opened beginning of July. And um, this is from actually the day before we opened, we did kind of a, an event outside. Uh, so at the podium though, I think we've shown this photo already this week, but not everybody's at every session. This is Truman's grandson, um, the oldest living Truman relative, Clifton Truman Daniel at the podium, not the statue, that's Harry. And the statue is uh, larger than life, which is unusual for Harry statues. They're usually life-size because Harry Truman did not himself want to be put on a pedestal. But when you talk to uh, sculptors and artists, when they talk about outside statues, they often feel like they should be larger. Um, so it's actually not on a platform. I know you can't see his feet there. He's actually on the ground level. He's not on a pedestal or anything, but he is about seven, seven and a half feet tall because it's outside. They tend to go larger than life as kind of an artistic thing. Anyway, we've been getting those questions already. The reason you see some kind of red material behind the Truman statue is that Clifton, Truman's grandson, and his, his oldest son, Wesley, Truman's great-grandson, uh, just right prior to Clifton's comments at the podium here, had, uh, had uh, unveiled the statue. So there was some kind of material um, they had over the statue that they had revealed. And in the background, you see all these men in white, and those are sailors from the USS Harry Truman. And they happened to be in town, and they did um, a skydive and landed, landed their parachutes in the green lawn in front of the Truman Library and then took a private tour of the new museum the day before we opened. And that was around July the 1st, I believe. And then July the 2nd, we reopened in time. As you know, we've been closed for two years for renovation and also pandemic. So let me kind of go into that. I'm gonna do a little bit of, um, kind of give you an overview of our education resources first. These all, this PowerPoint will be available so you can look at all of these links, but I know some of our teachers are very familiar with these resources, but actually we keep adding to them. So just for later on, uh, somebody mentioned about inquiry lessons earlier. So the fourth link down there is inquiry lessons we've created um, with teachers over the last five years. And then the third link is lesson plans that have been created by teachers that have attended this conference. So there's about 400 of those on the third link, and then there's about 15, and I can hear my cat. So he's got sound effects here. Um, so if you hear that, there's nothing I can do about it right now. So if you see me leaning, it's because I'm petting the cat to calm him down. And then there's a lot of videos that we've added on our YouTube channel. The reason I mentioned that is we got a new audio visual archivist two or three years ago, uh, actually from the Kennedy Library, and she is amazing. And her specialty is really digitizing video and getting that online. And that she found lots of the material that you're gonna see in our new exhibits that we didn't know we had. So for example, we have a multimedia video of the 1948 election campaign uh, in the exhibits that I'm gonna show you here in a few minutes. And she found color footage from the Ferdinand Magellan filming from the train that we'd never seen before. And that's incorporated in the video in the museum, but you can see all of it online. So if you want to sit through one hour of color footage from a shaky train, you can actually do that. So, but there's lots and lots of other um, videos that she's adding all the time. Those also include some of the programs and presentations that Angela and I have done, professional development, many of those with Therese and some other presentations as well um, that are also on our YouTube channel. Um, then we've got, of course, student documents, student research projects, our digital documents that many of you are familiar, very familiar with, on our photo database, which we've been using all week for our food photos and things like that. They're a lot of fun. And, and the last one there, a lot of you know, we sponsor the local National History Day competition. And so that resource is there too. Just wanted to point that out real quick. And I, I don't want to go through every link because I want to get to the museum exhibit itself. Um, so first of all, just kind of the background um, of who, this, who is uh, behind this. Sorry, I'm going crazy with my mouse. I need to just leave it alone. Um, 
the exhibit was designed, we get these questions, so I'm kind of putting this up the front so you know kind of who is behind it. Gallagher and Associates, that are Portland, Oregon, uh, were the designers. Clark Ennison in Kansas City with the architects. Uh, the multimedia is done by Manadnock, who are out on the, in New England. At 1220 are the people that actually build the exhibits, they're in Nashville. And I was very, very fortunate right before the pandemic to go with one of our exhibit staff to Nashville to see their workshop. Um, so when we see our 14 foot high globe a little bit later on, I was able to see it when it was orange slices in the fabrication studio sliced up. If you think of a globe, right? A ball sliced up like oranges and then they pieced it all together when they brought it to the Truman Library. So I'll never forget that I saw that in, in production and I saw her making the, the mud that's in our World War I exhibit area and things like that. And then we get a lot asked, I, we've been doing a lot of media. I was very fortunate to be on Steve Kraske on the local PBS um, KCUR radio program recently and on a few TV interviews and things. And they often ask about staff input. And I'll be honest with you, back in 2001, when we did our last renovation, there was a lot less staff input than there was on this particular renovation. Um, and you can tell when you look at the richness of the exhibit and the layers within the exhibit. So the main um, content team was the Klebowski, our museum curator. I believe he said last week in an interview, he's been at the library 38 years, phenomenal person. Uh, supervisory archivist, Sam Roche, who was at the library, left to work at the Nixon project and then came back to the Truman Library. So in all told, he's probably been there about 20 years and then, and then little old me on the content team and then supported then by some of our archivists that some of you know, Tammy Williams, Laurie Austin, our AV archivist, Randy Soule, who is, if you have any question ever about Truman, Randy is PhD historian and is probably the most uh, content ready person in the world on Truman and knows where every document is in the stacks. It's amazing. And then on the museum side, our registrar and museum technicians and things like that. So although we had the three content team, we had a lot of support from the rest of the staff too. This has been about a five year project. So although we've been closed for two years, we've been building this exhibit for a long time, going back and forth, as you can imagine with the designers and the architects and you know, the architects will find, oh, that's a load bearing column. You can't move that. You know, we're going to put a World War One tree around the column and disguise those things. So those those challenges as you go through um, this kind of exhibit design has been a highlight of my career. So uh, the title of the exhibit, and it's really, you know, um, I think a great title. It kind of sums up Truman's whole life: an ordinary man, his extraordinary journey. Uh, because that is the idea with with Truman compared to maybe say FDR or someone like that, he comes from nothing, really, you know, as you know, a, a farmer and a soldier and a men's clothing store owner and a, a county politician, and he rises to the highest position in the land and oversees, you know, so much with the ending of World War II and atomic bomb and Korean War and things like that. And I'm, if you can hear my cat, you're lucky. So he's really enjoying it. His name is Simon, and he might, he might make an appearance at the end if I lift him up. So that's kind of the title panel for the exhibit. And I know you can't read all the information there, but that's kind of what you see as you enter the exhibit itself. This is that outside shot. I kind of blew it up a little bit for you so you can see the banners outside. And the reason I show this again is because we have reconfigured the entrance to the building. So this is the east side where you, you would have come in before uh, for in-person teacher workshops, you would have come into this east side, but you can see this grand new entrance with the presidential seal on the window. And we've added about 3000 square foot feet to the building on this east side. The main entrance is still usable, but it's gonna be more for special events and things like that. A lot of that decision, well, there were two main factors. One is to block off the light from the Benton mural that's on that um, main, old main entrance side. And uh, secondly, we wanted to, as we, as we went into the design of the exhibit, as we decided on a chronological approach, we wanted the flow of the exhibit to go from you know, birth to death. And this was easier to flow the building this way 
and end up really where the Benton mural is uh, to do a thematic area there of the Truman's in independence. And as that painting is independence in the opening of the West, it fit into that theme and it's also post-presidency. So in terms of chronology, it fits too. And as I mentioned, that's Truman's oldest grandson at the podium. He now lives in Chicago, but he's very well um, connected with the library, serves on the board of directors and was just thrilled. In fact, he was joking as they took him around. He'd actually not seen a completed exhibit until that day. And when they took him around and they were trying to get the media to get quotes out of him. And every time he turned a corner into a new gallery, he just kept saying, wow, wow, wow. And he was like, I need to come up with another word, but wow. So, you know, that's pretty um, reaffirming to have his oldest grandson, who is actually a Truman scholar. He does one act plays on Truman and things like that. So he's not just a family member, but well-versed in the history and speaks himself on public programs and things. I see lots of things coming in the chat. I will get to those at the end, if I may, because um, I'm not that good with technology to do all, to open the chat right now, we'll lose everything. So, okay, we're gonna go inside the building. So this is kind of the entrance. You'll see the, the portrait of Truman on the left and the Harry Truman signature on the right. So the left is where you went to the exhibit, the right is where you exit. And this is the bathrooms. I didn't include bathroom photos on the exhibit uh, preview, but there we go. That's where they would go. And you would go into an introductory theater on the left. It's about a three minute stand up video uh, where you kind of dropped actually in to um, the most momentous day of Truman's life, which is April 12th, 1945, when FDR dies and Truman becomes president. And so the video backs up about um, nine months back to the summer of 1944 and the convention where Truman is nominated uh, to be Truman's, to be FDR's running mate. And then very quickly in three minutes goes from July of 44 through to the election in November where Truman is elected vice president, inauguration day in July. And then all the world events that are going on in, in Europe and in Asia, Iwo Jima, uh, you know, the allies getting closer, uh, to shaking hands in Germany. And then the video abruptly stops in April uh, when FDR dies and Truman takes the oath of office. And the whole piece is surrounded by quotes from the time, not from later, from the time of raising a lot of skepticism. Who is this guy? Who is Harry Truman? Can he do this? Lots of newspaper editorials. You know, he has a strong challenge he has to meet. You know, that all of these things that are going on in the world, how, who is this guy? And because really, although he's been vice president, he's, no, he's really largely unknown. And then it comes up with a couple of things at the very end to remind us um, the fact that Truman was only vice president for 82 days, that he only meets FDR in person privately twice and sets you up with an inquiry question. My fingerprints are on this exhibit. There's lots of inquiry questions. And the question it starts with is what in Truman's past prepared him for the presidency? And that's featured in the video at the very end. And then on the very first exhibit panel when you walk into the exhibit. So what in Truman's past even prepared him for this? So we really didn't want to start the exhibit necessarily with Harry Truman was born in Lamar, Missouri in 1884. We wanted a more dramatic beginning than that. And so we went with the day that it becomes president. It takes us about three minutes to get to that point. And then we go into the exhibits that talk about his early life, his early education and so on. Trying to answer that question with that question in mind. So what in his background prepared him? And in many ways, he wasn't prepared. And that's, that's part of the answer. He wasn't prepared in, in many ways. So this is kind of a screenshot of the video. I should have advanced that a little bit further. It's a huge video screen. It's actually two-sided. You'd look at one and then there's lots of quotes rolling behind you. It's kind of like shaped like a conch shell. Um, so it's huge screen, it rolls across. Um, so as I said, it starts in the Democrat convention and then moves forward quickly in three minutes to April of 1945. And that's where it ends to drop you into the story. And then you go into this first exhibit room. Now, many of these photos are a little bit dated now. And while the construction was going on, I probably should need to go in and do some cleaner photos. I actually kind of like these photos of the construction because you can see what's going into it. Um, um, but there in the middle of the room, 
of this first gallery is a letter tower. I think I used it as a virtual background earlier this week. And a lot of what we talk about in this room is a relationship to Bess Wallace. And they start dating about 1910. And of course we have those uh, 1300 letters across their life um, that Harry writes to Bess. And so we illuminate many of those and there's on the table surrounding it, you can see a flip book with examples of letters. And we also talk about at this time period, we don't have any from Bess up until 19 at 19, she burned those. But we have all of Harry's, or at least as far as we know, many, many, many of Harry's. And in this time period, from 1910 to about 1917, we have almost 300 letters from Harry Truman to Bess. And that's really what informs us about his life on the farm. Uh, that's when he's writing to her while he's a farmer. He starts working on the farm in 1906, but these letters start from about 1910, up until he leaves for France. Uh, you know, he joins the military in 1917 and leaves for France in 1918. And then of course those letters continue from France, but this particular area of the exhibit deals with that early period from 1884 when he's born through to 1917, this early section. So there's a family tree, uh, there's the, his love of the piano, his early jobs, his early school life, and influences on his life as well. Um, then we go into a World War I area where we have a multimedia presentation and we have our uh, 75 millimeter gun and caisson in the mud in front of the video screen. And the video is not about World War I in, in its entirety. It's about Harry Truman's experience in World War I and the lessons that he learns. And if you go back to that question, what shaped him to become president? You know, what, what things influenced him? Well, World War I was a key moment for him. It taught him leadership. Really, he had that leadership, but it gave him his own confidence to lead. And that's kind of the thesis of the video, if you like. Um, the 1220 company out of Nashville are the ones that built the, built the replica mud and trees and scenery. And there's even cigarette butts and uh, horse print, horse shoe prints and boot prints in the mud. And it's a really effective six, seven minute video that really talks about Truman's experience in as a captain of Battery D in France. A lot of it is about him learning to um, fire the 75 millimeter French 75 gun and the math skills and the trajectory and all of those things. And that's featured in an interactive in the other side of this World War I gallery, which includes some of the artifacts and some of the materials uh, related to Truman's war experience. We have probably, we do have more, more artifacts in this exhibit than we've ever had before. There are more than 200 original artifacts. It might surprise you, you know, upstairs in our old exhibit, which just dealt with Truman's presidency, we had less than a dozen original artifacts. Most of our original artifacts in the previous show were downstairs in the Life and Times exhibit. Uh, but upstairs now, because this whole gallery is all on one level, there's more than 200 original artifacts. And some of them I'll show you a little bit later on have never been displayed before. And so this is the interactive game that I was explaining. So there's a mechanical uh, component where you actually turn the wheel. You know, usually when you see an interactive in a museum, it's either a touch screen like a computer or it's, you know, you pull a lever or you slide, a, slide something. This one's a combination of the two. So it's both tactile, but it's also digital. Um, so that was kind of a, a real experiment for us. Um, I will tell you the idea for this. I met with a gentleman that works at the museum in Jefferson City, uh, the State Capitol Museum there, and he was they were doing a special event about four years ago about World War I commemorations. So I guess it would have been in uh, 2017 with the 100th anniversary of the United States entering the war. And I did a program and we were talking together, brainstorming about how can you, how can you show how you, know, you fired the French 75? It was such a big part of the American involvement in World War I. And we were even talking about um, PVC tubing. You, know, you could fire ping pong balls across the galleries and you know our curators were never going to buy that so they love the idea of doing this digitally so what you actually do here is you actually turn the wheel and you change the angle of the turret of the of the field gun and then you get instructions from Truman on the screen of what angle to fire it at and you get to fire the fire the 75 millimeter gun across the across no man's land and then it tells you you missed and you've got to recalibrate 
And there's actually a math screen that shows you the formula that Truman used. So there's definitely some STEM and technology involved in this too. So that's kind of a fun one. And uh, it's gone through a lot of iterations and, uh, but it's, it's working and functioning now for the visitors that have been coming in the museum since July the 3rd. Um, this is kind of a before the exhibit was finished, but what does Harry do, Harry do when he comes home? First thing he does is he gets married, right? So this is the wedding photograph and it's not in this particular photo, but um, now installed are Bess Wallace's wedding shoes, wedding invitation. And then the case over here on the right is material related to Margaret Truman. In this time period, when we get into the twenties, we do have letters from Bess. So we actually have letters back and forth that are featured in a flip book and then on the walls. Um, and you get a different sense of Bess Truman when you read these letters. Um, you know, a lot of people have the misconceptions about Bess, but this, this uh, correspondence, you really see um, the love and affection that she has for Harry Truman throughout the correspondence. One of the interesting features in that particular exchange of letters is that Bess is asking permission from Harry to get a haircut. I kid you not. And we kind of feature that deliberately because it kind of shows a different side of things. She wants the 1920s Bob haircut and she's asking Harry for permission. Well, if you know anything about Harry Truman, one of the things he talks about a lot was that he falls in love with Bess's curls when she's six years old in Sunday school. And so he's really reluctant for her to cut all of that off, but eventually he caves. But she's asking permission to get a haircut. So, you know, ladies, don't go with that. Get a haircut. You don't have to ask permission from anyone. Says someone who's married with three daughters, right? I have no choice but to say that. So, and then, I skipped over the Margaret thing because I didn't have the photos right in front of me, but there's a whole case of Margaret Truman's first 20 years with her baby carriage and dresses from the 1944 convention and, and a really some great materials related to Margaret Truman. And then we get into, into the 20s and Truman's connections to the Pendergast machine. And one of the things we try to do is try and show Truman warts and all. Um, so if there's negatives, we include them. So we include the steel crisis, we include the Taft-Hartley bill, we include his rants and raves, we, and you'll see in the Korean War exhibit, the criticism that he receives and so forth. And we certainly include materials related to the Pendergast era in the 20s and 30s when Truman is the, first of all, county commissioner, county judge, and then the US Senator from Missouri. And this is kind of the backup of that. So the whole Pendergast machine and. This exhibit case is now full with a chandelier from the Jackson County Courthouse in Kansas City that Truman uh, authorized, the map in the background of the road building that he did as a county commissioner and so on. And in the front of that case, when it's filled now, are his own writings from what we call the Pickwick Papers, his writings from the Pickwick Hotel in Kansas City, where he is actually lamenting, uh, he vents and worries about his connections to Pendergast and what the boss is wanting him to do. These are letters that he wrote, but he never mailed to anybody. It was his way of venting. And all of those uh, are featured in that beginning of the, the, um, the forefront of that exhibit case. They're very revealing. And he uses some pretty choice language in those as well. He doesn't hold back at all. Then we get more into the Senate. Uh, he's a senator for 10 years from 34 to 44 before he's nominated as the vice president as we mentioned earlier. And the one thing that he really is well known for the, uh, within Senate circles anyway, he takes over the committee looking at overspending in the defense industry. And that gets him on the front page of national magazines as he saves the country. And I might get the figure wrong, but it's somewhere in the region of $9 billion through his work uh, on the, it becomes known as the Truman Committee. And that's where he's well known in Senate circles, but in the public's mind, he's, he's not known um, as much, which is why we have that question in April when he becomes president. And then we um, have a whole feature on FDR's death, funeral video footage, and photographs of Truman taking the oath of office. Um, and on display is the Bible that Truman takes the oath of office, the Gideon Bible that they scrambled around to find. Um, in haste on April the 12th. And then you see this timeline um, of those first four months. 
And in fact, just as a resource, um, AJ Bain, B A I N B A I N E, AJ Bain, uh, has written a book on the accidental president, and it focuses on those first four months of Truman's presidency. And if you think about that for a minute, um, so he comes in office in April, Germany surrenders in May. Uh, he goes to the United Nations in San Francisco to start the United Nations in June. He's in Potsdam in July, meeting with Stalin and Churchill and then Attlee after Churchill is replaced. The atomic bomb testing takes place in July and he makes the decision to drop the atomic bomb in August. And then he receives the Harrison report about the displaced persons camps in August. By November, the Nuremberg trials have started. I mean, it goes on and on, right? But these first four months from April to August are featured in this kind of tunnel-like exhibit. It's a little wider than it looks in reality. On the right side is a timeline with a featured document, a newsreel video, and a featured artifact uh, for each one for each month. And on the left is the run-up to the decision to drop the atomic bomb. So it's a very, it's a very dramatic um, display and people really are enjoying that piece the way that's been designed. So, you know, this is where you rely on the designers. We know the information, but I would never have come up with a design like this. And it's really effective when you look at all of the things that he faced in those first four months. And we think again, that he only met with FDR twice in those three months prior. So he was making all these decisions with very little preparation. I kind of surprised my director, I was giving a tour recently to a small group and I turned the question on its head about, you know, how was Truman prepared for the presidency? I said he wasn't. <laughs> he had to think on his feet and get good advice and surround himself with good advisors. And in many ways he wasn't prepared, but he had to make those decisions anyway. And, um, my boss actually complimented me for that. So that was kind of fun. He's a great guy. At the end of that corridor, we deal with the atomic bomb, but we do so. And people who know me know that I like stories associated with artifacts. I'm a big proponent of object-based learning, which is probably good because I work in a museum, right? So, but object-based learning is really crucial to me and to our education. So you can look at an object and tell a story through that original artifact. So here we have two that are kind of juxtaposed. The, the one on the left is in the center of the room and the one on the right is the back of the room. That photograph is way bigger than the original. <laughs> the one on the left is the safety plug from the atomic bomb that was dropped on Nagasaki. So if you think about that, when you've got the atomic bomb ready to go on the, on the plane, the last thing they do is withdraw the safety plug and live arm it with the red plug, which is the activating plug. Well, the engineer, Mr. Ashworth, uh, kept that safety plug from the bomb that was on Nagasaki and donated it to the Truman Library in the 1990s. On the right is the paper crane, one of the paper cranes folded by Sadako Suzaki, uh, who um, had radiation sickness from the bombs on Hiroshima. And one of the Japanese customs is to fold a thousand paper cranes to make a wish and she wished for peace in the world and we're very fortunate that she passed away because of radiation sickness in the 1950s but her um, brother had one of the last cranes that she folded and he gave that to Clifton Truman Daniel Truman's grandson and then Clifton passed that on to the library and so we have both of those displayed to show the different perspectives related to the atomic bomb in the same gallery. And it's very, very powerfully done. And again, it's that idea that artifacts can really help tell a story. Uh, then we get to the end of World War II, of course, and we have the casualty figures on the wall and the Soviet Union actually wraps into the ceiling because there's so many. And then you enter the post-war world. And this is that 14 foot high globe that I mentioned that people are stunned when they see this. It's really dramatic. Uh, you go in and it's um, what it does, because you can see all the cracks and so forth in the globe. It shows how um, the world that Truman faces after September of 1945 and the official surrender by Japan and the war is over in both Europe and Asia, is all the problems all over the world, the post-war world. So the world is cracked, 
the world is fractured. And so that's the centerpiece of the gallery. And there's newsreel from all over the world, from all continents, um, displayed silently on the globe. There's actually three videos, one on the left, one in the center, one on the right, that show you problems in America, problems in Asia, problems in Europe, problems everywhere, problems in South America. Um, to just show you all of the things going on all over the world. And then the outside of that museum exhibit gallery are what I call Truman's Band-Aids, his attempts at solutions. He doesn't try to solve everything. He doesn't succeed in solving everything, but he's trying to paper over the cracks and get the United States and the world in, in many ways kind of back up and running. The Marshall Plan is probably the most obvious example if you think of that economic aid. Um, to, even to your defeated enemy. But of course, things like the Truman Doctrine, the Berlin blockade and other things, and then domestic things too, like the rail strikes and things like that and economic reconversion. So United States has covered that too. So those are the exhibits on the outside of this room. You can actually go inside the globe too. So there's our engineer, Mike, great guy. Uh, he's exploring this and it changes colors. And you can actually go inside. That wasn't done at that point, but inside there are three touch screens where you can learn about families in 1945 in China, Japan, displaced persons, German population, African American population, and United States families around the world. What problems are they facing in education, refugees? all done through three touchscreen videos, touchscreen displays, which are very effective. In that corner of that gallery, there's a Cold War video. It's kind of hard to show, but it's on, it uses a technology called projection mapping, where you can um, have various projectors. I think the six in this room that project onto different three-dimensional surfaces. So we have rubble that makes out in the shape of Europe, or there's a window frame. Uh, there's different uh, pieces of rubble that, that displayed on that really talk about the beginnings of the Cold War. It goes from um, the end of the war up to um, the end of the Berlin blockade crisis. So from about 45 to 49 and talks about this new kind of war, the Cold War. And it's a very effective video. And that one is narrated actually by George Stephanopoulos. I should have mentioned, uh, I'll mention a couple of the others when we get to them about the different narrators that we have. Clifton Truman Daniel, for example, narrates the 1948 election video and so on. And this is just another shot of that. You can kind of see Truman in the window frame of this blown out. They're kind of showing that the, the, the rubble in Europe at the time is kind of the, the uh, detail that they did with the scenery. It's very effective. And then we turn to the, Berl the um, Berlin blockade and the Berlin airlift. And we have kind of the mimic of the interior of the fuselage goes into the, into the wall. And I think I might have more. Yeah, there we go. And those are illuminated on the inside so you can see some of the statistics. On the left screen down here is a video about Gail Halverson, the Berlin candy bomber. Uh, as many of you know, he attended one of our previous conferences in 2008 and we were very, um, fortunate to meet him and hear from him and he's still alive. He's now 100, maybe 101. Kate would know better than I his exact age, but he know, I know he turned 100, I think last year. And apparently he's doing either about to or just done another uh, parachute drop in Utah. I think it might be his last one, but there's a video there with Gail talking and then there's a touchscreen table. There we go, touchscreen table that you can explore the Berlin blockade by putting uh, a three-dimensional plane on the table and that you can interact with the table uh, to learn more about the Berlin blockade, which is a really fascinating story and really the first, the first conflict of the Cold War. So it's a really good case study to look at and the logistics of that. It's uh, kind of amazing. And this is one of those presidential decisions that was meant to be done as a stopgap and temporary measure, and it becomes the policy. So it's fascinating to explore that in its detail. And then we go in that also in 1948 is Truman's recognition of Israel. And we have a seven minute video on Truman recognizing Israel. And I, I got really lucky taking this photograph because it, it landed right on the key moment of when Truman recognizes Israel 
in May of 1948, 11 minutes after Israel is declared as a nation. And in that same gallery, I'm not sure if I've got uh, the pictures of the artifacts there, but we have a number of artifacts. Some of them have not been seen before. Uh, there's a whole discussion about displaced persons, the, pan the mandate, the background, the timeline, the, the um, conflicting opinions from his own cabinet. This is the one major decision that Truman makes that his own cabinet uh, disagree with him, particularly uh, George Marshall and uh, one of the Secretary of State uh, staff members, Roy Henderson and others are really against Truman's policy uh, towards Israel, but he does it anyway. And then some of the artifacts are in there too. One of the things we have with the flip books, not only do we have the letters back and forth from Harry and Bess, but in this particular case, we have a communication both pro and con. We do this with civil rights as well. So, you know, the first one on the left, the Jewish people have absolutely no moral or legal right to land which their ancestors have not controlled for more than 2000 years. The civil rights of the Arabs must be observed. And then on the right, we have absolutely approve of your plan and so forth. So we've got corresponding, I mean, contrasting letters and documents um, throughout the exhibit and in particular, uh, in this format where you can see both sides represented, which I think is really powerful. Then we move to civil rights, which is also in 1948. Um, and so Truman um, issues the executive order 9981 to integrate the military and has his committee on civil rights. And the story of Isaac Woodard there is, is, is retold. For those that you don't know that story, I would look into it. It's, the, it's probably the episode that really convinces Truman to take action. He's the first president to address the NAACP. Um, we have a video in this area too, that's actually uh, narrated by one of our local uh, politicians, Emmanuel Kleber is the narrator for that a civil rights video as well. And the, um, to secure these rights, um, the uh, report is reproduced there in the flip book as well, which is the one if you remember has the different um, infographics and polls and things that were done at that time. Then we get more towards the 1948 election itself. And this is some of that color footage uh, on the screen as it's waiting to start. These are all timed. Uh, this one is the one that's narrated by Clifton Truman Daniel. It's really well done. Um, you don't believe how many edits these videos go through. Oh my gosh, it's amazing. And this is done on three screens on the back of the train and it's very effective and um, finishes, of course, with the Dewey Defeats Truman, which is over on this side. And the ca exhibit case that's been installed since this has an original Dewey Defeats Truman newspaper and so forth. Let me just, before I, I'll keep talking about 40, like I didn't have a photograph of that, but a lot of people ask, the Norman Rockwell painting that's from the 1948 election is featured in that area as well, the family squabble um, that I use a lot for presentations. Uh, so that's in that area. I just didn't happen to have a photo of that. Then we look at Truman's domestic legislation in the second term, in particular, the fur deal. These holes have flip panels in them where you can see what happened to his legislation if they were enacted or not, mostly not, but then what happened to them later um, in, in post, you know, in, in um, presidencies that followed Truman, what they did with some of those same actions. So Truman is setting the path forward that other presidents are going to take on that mantle and pass legislation or try to, such as healthcare, Medicare, civil rights, and so on. And then we move into the Red Scare. We have an interactive game on the loyalty oath program, which is about a seven minute thing. And you find out whether you can fire people for being disloyal, and then you are put on the spot as well and you have to answer loyalty oath questions, which are all accurate questions from those hearings. And in the background, there's video of the testimony by Hollywood executives. And there's an interactive on the corner of the room about the Hollywood Nine. Charlie Chaplin and others are featured there. Then we move into the Korean War. There's a six screen video wall. We don't have these things laying on the floor anymore. And there's questions posed on the wall. And this is a uh, Juju Chang is the narrator for that one. One of the things I want to say about the Korean War exhibit, some of this is on the floor, but it is all displayed now. It goes through kind of month by month, uh, the conflict, and I'm really hoping if I remember my PowerPoint, let me skip through. You can see the 
progression of the war. Do I have it? No, I don't. Shoot. Okay. We do have on display uh, some materials there that we've never displayed before. Uh, there was a museum in Springfield, Illinois that closed that was related to the Korean War, and we inherited their collection. And as part of that, we received about 75 military uniforms from the Korean War, and we've got five of them on display in that new area that have never been seen, including uh, medical kits, stretcher, surgery lamps. So we deal with it in a way thematically, we look at integration of the forces that takes place after the executive order of 48, it really takes the Korean War to accelerate that integration. Uh, so by the end of world, uh, by the end of the Korean War, the troops are 98% integrated. I know you dealt with that on uh, Monday with the executive order. Uh, by the end of the Korean War, 98% integrated. The army is the slowest of the different branches. They are kicked in the rear a few times by Truman to get them to accelerate, but the Korean War really forces it along. There's also some treatment about the, um, the medical advancements, um, both through women and nurses that are at the front, but also the technological advances using helicopters like hospital ships, because in the terrain in Korea, it was very difficult to get armored vehicles to soldiers that were down in the mountains. And so they start to use helicopters in that way. And so we have a triage mat that would have been used to alert the helicopter to an injury. So we have one of those on display in that area. Um, and then what I've found in my research, and it's not featured that heavily in the exhibit itself, but just in the background of doing this, is that there was an on, a, a massive increase in blood transfusions. Um, the technology for blood transfusions changed due to the Korean War, and they discovered they could in fact transport blood in plastic, whereas before it was done in glass. Well, you can imagine the efficiency of that would be skyrocketed. And actually the mortality rate because of the helicopters, because of blood transfusions, because of the mass units, the mortality rate dropped compared to World War II of injured soldiers at the front due to a combination of those factors. And one of the interesting factor you can use on trivia night somewhere is that when they did the blood transfusion drives to get people to donate blood, the country that donated the most blood during the Korean War to the United Nations forces was Japan. Because if you think about the onset of communism spreading, who's next after Korea? You look at a map, Japan is under threat. And so they are very much in favor of the United Nations being in South Korea and they donate the most blood, which it's not featured in the exhibit, but it's in my head. So there we go. And so the Korean War is a really well affected piece. The other part there from the previous exhibit is we do have the Purple Heart and the letter from Mr. Banning that some of you might remember, a very scathing letter where he criticizes Truman's actions in Korea and wishes his, his son has died as a soldier in the Korean War, and he wishes the same treatment on Truman's daughter, Margaret. Truman keeps that letter and that purple heart in his desk for the rest of his life. And we discovered that after he died in 1972. And that is a centerpiece of that exhibit, talking about presidential responsibility and um, the decisions that Truman made. As, as I've mentioned in other presentations, the Korean War was Truman decided himself was the most difficult decision that he made, not the, not the atomic bomb or Israel. It was the Korean War because he was putting men on the ground. And as a combat veteran himself, and the only president to serve in combat in World War I, he knew the uh, repercussions of putting soldiers on the ground in war. And he felt that was his most difficult decision. And then he receives that letter in Purple Heart returned to him by the father of a deceased veteran. So it's a very powerful exhibit. And again, it's that idea of one artifact telling the story. Uh, in fact, when I was on that Steve Kraske radio station uh, live interview, they, he asked each of us, there were three of us, me, the director and one of our archivists, he asked us each what our oh, favorite is the right word, but most powerful artifact. And I chose that Purple Heart and Steve Kraske uh, immediately said, oh yes, I've seen that's very powerful. So it was, it was, he had really taken note of that. Then we get to our old main entrance where the Benton mural has beautifully been cleaned and conserved and it looks great. You can see a lot of construction equipment there, but in that area, we have two videos of um, Truman's and Independence prior to 
um, the presidency and Truman's in independence post-presidency. So the whole theme of that area is the Truman's in independence, the return to independence, and then their influences growing up there. And then we move to where our old gift shop used to be. And that is the Truman's in Washington. Of course, he lived in Washington almost 18 years. People forget that because he was a senator for 10 and president for almost eight years. So we have a whole section of their life in Washington, uh, which is where I think I showed yesterday one of the renovation displays. And there's, they've kind of got that White House architecture where you have the photos of their time in Washington. And um, this is much earlier on in the installation, but this is the fireplace that was taken out of the White House um, during the White House renovation. And um, is been reinstalled in the library. It was actually on display when the library first opened in 1957. And it's almost entirely back in the same place that it was back in 1957, because it needs an outside load bearing wall to hold it up because it's so heavy. And then above is the White House beams that we had downstairs before, which came from the White House. Those are the ones that Margaret Truman's piano leg uh, came through the ceiling and started the whole renovation project. And there's a few more of the photos there of what uh, Truman called the Great White Jail. He much preferred his time in Washington as a senator far more than he did as a president in terms of living in Washington because he was often alone because Bess was back in independence taking care of our aging mother. In fact, Truman's mother-in-law, Bess's mother, dies in the White House in December of 1952, a month before Truman leaves office. Um, another fun fact. We do have an interactive there, the touch screen where you can explore the um, renovation and choose each floor and then choose rooms in each floor. And you can see photographs before, during and after. All of those Abbey Road National Park Service photographs that are in our collection. Um, those, that's a really fascinating interactive. It's really well done. And then you can see our engineer. Our engineer, Mike, gets in all these photos, doesn't he? So there he is playing there. You can see that they actually display on the big screen for everybody to see as well as what he's choosing um, below. And in fact, this photo is showing, I believe the blue room, and we do have a color version of this photo too. And behind him in the exhibit are the original silk samples from the blue room, the green room, and the red room that Bess Truman chose for the renovation. So um, I think that's a neat feature. And I see there's 26 questions in the chat, or at least comments. So I'm scared of finishing my presentation. Then back by the Oval Office area and the book stops here, we have a three branches of government, which ties us all back to our theme for the week, where we have a section on the legislative branch, the executive branch, and the judicial branch. And we have a whole section about how a bill becomes a law. And we have an interactive below this panel where you get to spin some cubes to see how you pass uh, legislation. And the example we use is actually Taft-Hartley, which Andrew and I mentioned with the steel crisis. We chose deliberately for both the legislative and the judicial branch, kind of negative examples of where there's checks and balances. So in case of Taft-Hartley, a bill or act, it's where Truman uh, vetoes the bill and then Congress overrides the veto. So when you go through the steps, it actually goes through every step all the way through to overriding the veto, because of course that doesn't happen as often. And then the judicial branch uses the case that um, Andrew and I talked about on earlier in the week, which is the steel crisis. Again, that idea of the checks and balances, and we use the example of the steel crisis to do that. So again, two kind of, in a way, negative examples. And then the executive branch focuses more on what Truman said in a speech with the six jobs of the president and we have a calendar showing where he uses all six jobs in one day in one particular calendar entry there. And then as you walk out of the gallery, there's a legacy section, there's a selfie station because those are required in museums, it feels like. And then there's some really nice videos summing up Truman's legacy and quotes from Kofi Annan, Madeleine Albright, Barack Obama, President Bush, um, Bill Clinton and others featured. And then as you walk out, you can see out into the courtyard where Truman is buried and Mrs. Truman and the ashes of their daughter and son-in-law are also in the courtyard as well. Uh, his daughter incidentally died in 2008. There will be no more family plots added apparently. 
And then as you're leaving, you can, can see there's a lot of cartoons from the newspapers at the time after Truman's death in December 26, 1972. So here you see all these steps, atomic development, United Nations, Marshall Plan, NATO, Berlin, Truman Doctrine, Civil Rights. And this makes me think back to the original question at the beginning of the exhibit is, you know, Senator Vandenberg said, Could, can Truman swing the job? Can he do this? You know, he's unknown. Is he capable of doing it? Does he have the leadership qualities to meet the test? These are the kind of quotes we had at the beginning. And here we see these accomplishments at the end. Certainly not flawless. Certainly could have done more with civil rights, as Carol Anderson would say. Certainly could have done more with some of these other issues. But I think we have, the, we have video footage there from, a, uh, from uh, Walter Cronkite. And Walter Cronkite says he did his damnedest. And I think that's that's a good way to sum that up. Whether it was good, right, or indifferent, he did his damnedest. So, and then we kind of see this uh, full career here starts out with farmer, soldier, businessman, politician, president, and it's cut off a little bit. But it finishes as a family man. He ends up with four grandsons uh, from his daughter Margaret. And then we have a quote on the wall. And this this Truman statue that was there before is now physically in place below this quote. Mrs. Truman and I hope and believe we have contributed to the welfare of this nation and to the peace of the world. And that's back in our new lobby. And you know this information already. So I'm gonna stop there and I'm gonna to go to the chat and I don't know if I can get all of this. So, I mean, give me a second to scroll back up. Gosh, you guys were active. Let me see here what I can pick up. Uh, there's the Mexican-American, Stevenson's. Okay, the survey, there's a thing there, Truman on the beach. You, you like Simon's commentary, Teresa, yeah, me too. He's gone quiet. That Accidental President is a great book. Uh, let me say something too. He all, the same author, A.J. Bame, also did an incredible book on the 1948 election. And the reason I like it is that he goes back and forth with the candidates. So when he's saying Truman is doing this on June the 2nd, he's like, Thomas Dewey is doing this and Wallace is doing this. And he, so he talks about all of the, Strom Thurmond is doing this. So he, he kind of, it's mostly of course about Truman, but he talks about some of the other candidates. So that's a really great book too. And that's a long, long link. Wow. Okay, Candy Bomber is a great read on the Berlin Airlift. Absolutely. And um, incredible person. and. I think Kate had to leave, but she's got photographs of a meeting at Arthur Bryant's barbecue with us, which is one of my favorite photos. I have it framed in my office. Um, yep, Candy Bomber, uh, video link. Air Force One has box car, yep. The plane, this is good because they're not questions. <laughs> Yeah, I know you might be far away, but come visit us. If you come visit and tell me you're coming, you don't have to pay. So how's that? Uh, he did the jump on 4th of July. Yeah, um, yeah we'll see. It's a long yeah, one right now. I can save you $12, Rocky. So, you know. <laughs> I, I, if it's a, uh, thank you, I'll, I'll take that up. But uh, as a uh, disabled veteran, I, one of the things I was uh, able to get, and I don't know if it applies here, but they have that thing called the golden passport, which means that all federal parks and, and those right. type of things, there's no charge at all forever. So. And then uh, you said your best friend was on the Secret Service detail that saved Truman from the attacking of his life. Yep, yeah, it was at uh, Blair House was where he was when the at attempt took place. And that we've got the pistols on display in the museum, actually. Interestingly, that same fellow uh, in 1968 during the T Tet Offensive, he was in charge of the security of the United States Embassy in Vietnam. And you can look at the photos. He's the guy that's tossing a pistol to the, the Marine on the second floor when the Viet Cong are actually in the embassy. But it's the same guy, and he got the the highest civilian medal you can get from um, in the in the in the Foreign Service because he that's where he went. He went to the Foreign Service. Thank you for sharing that. Peggy asked about the Berlin blockade. The veteran, it's Gail Halverson. 
and he was a pilot. And he's the one that started dropping candy to the children surrounding the airfield. So he's known as the candy bomber. There's a number of books about him. There's a children's book called uh, Mercedes and the Candy Bomber, who's a German child that he reunited with later. Um, but, and, and he has his own web page and videos and YouTube things. Uh, da, da, da. Yeah, Pam says Candy Bomber rode with me to Arthur Bryan's. He's a very brave man. <laughs> Gail Halverson. Um, yeah, people are answering that. And then Mercedes and the Chocolate Pilot book from Kate. So I think I got the comments. If I missed one, go ahead and retype it. I scrolled fast there. Um, Therese posted the survey. I'm going to give you some information about next year here in a second. And yeah, there's a lot of materials out there. There's some, you know, you can do some STEM things with different types of parachutes and uh, just the logistics of um, the airlift itself, but it gets you into the story with that human aspect of it. So Teresa's reposted the survey. Let me tell you a couple of logistical things and we'll wrap up. We'll try and get done here by noon central as promised. Um, first is if you would like a um, certificate of participation for your school district or whatever you need to get credit from your district, this is not college credit, that's different. If you would like that, email me. Not everybody requires it. So if you need it, email it to me and I'll send I you out. I put a spot in the survey too, Mark, where they could oh, put good. in their email if they oh, want it. Yeah, so if it's in the survey, that's even better. So if you've got the question, if you want the certificate, yes or no, if you need it, I can email that to you this afternoon. Second, if you're doing the college credit, you should have received the information from the university at Lindenwood, Lindenwood University. If you need that again, let me know, but you should have that already from a while ago. Uh, and then next year, let me see if I can share my screen. I've got actually two computer stations going here, so I gotta make sure I use the right mouse. Let me see. Uh, Mm -hmm. I'm not seeing it right now. Hang on. I'll keep you on hold a bit longer. Hang on. Let me pull this up. Our computers are so crazy. There we go. I should be able to do it now. We got too many tabs open. There we go. So, uh, can you see that? Yep. So there's the date, the title is Presidential Character. And underneath of that, and this is what I'm gonna be telling my presenters to answer these questions or to attempt to answer these questions. How does character influence presidential decision-making, good and bad? What character traits and other factors should we look for in a president? How important is the character of a president and influenced by our new exhibit that I just shared how does a president's early life shape his presidency? So we're getting into character. You can imagine we'll be looking at some of our National Archives folks to help us, but we're gonna be looking to get some um, presentations from the likes of Mount Vernon, the Hermitage and Andrew John Jackson, the Lincoln Presidential Library. So some of the other earlier presidents outside of the Norris system, we've got a really good contact at the um, Teddy Roosevelt Center in, in South Dakota and some other, and um, uh, Grant in St. Louis and some other places, some of our National Park Service sites. They've actually participated a lot with Teresa and, and the Internet 2 projects. Yeah, so there's a lot of good ones. Yeah, there's some really great ones. And I've met a lot of them through these types of projects. We've developed some good networks about that. Um, and then my former boss is the director at the Hermitage, the Andrew Jackson site so she's been a really good connector there the jackson site um those of you that remember amy williams our deputy director she's now the director of the hermitage in um down there in nashville so that's next year july 11th 15th registration will probably open in january as i piece together the presenters and that will be in person and i think we can probably take a few more people because i've mentioned a couple of times we're renovating our classrooms so we're gonna be able to join two classrooms together with a dividing wall. So what we called our 
which will stop an independence room. We should be able by next summer to combine those into one large room, which will really be exciting. So let me stop the share because I see there's a comment here. Sounds terrific. Um, so any uh, final questions, comments? I can't believe we're one minute to noon. That's amazing timing. Lots of thank yous. Really appreciate your participation. I will tell you one of the things we deliberately did as appreciation for all of you is to offer this for free this week. Um, that was a deliberate uh, strategy of mine as a thank you. I know how my fifth graders struggled through the school year doing virtual, hybrid, and in-person all in one school year. Um, so I know how hard it's been for you guys. So thank you. I'll stay on the line for a few more minutes.